Okay, welcome everybody to the panel cashing in on objectivism. So the real goal here is so much of our focus, I think as objectivists, but certainly coming to conferences like this is cultural analysis, it's understanding some of the finer points about the philosophy, and all of that is super important. Yet, the reason that I think most of us got into objectivism is we read the novels and we have a certain vision of life and we want to realize that vision in our own life. And so we really wanted to take the opportunity to make a special focus on how do I get the most out of the philosophy for me? How do I take what I'm learning from Ayn Rand's novels, from Ocon lectures, from Ayn Rand University courses, and inject that into my life so that I can lead a happy life. And that led to this particular panel, and I know that most of these people need no introduction, but I, I will, however, give, give one. So I'm Dom Watkins, I'm one of the speakers, I am a longtime objectivist writer, and uh, currently am the VP of Marketing and Fundraising for the Ayn Rand Institute. And my last book was a book called Effective Egoism, where I talk about how to pursue happiness and the role of morality in helping you pursue happiness. Tara Smith is a philosophy professor at the University of Texas at Austin, author of many books. Uh, one, the, the first time I encountered Tara's work was a book called Vi Viable Values, which came out around 2000, I think, Tara? Oh, I forget. Somewhere in that neighborhood. But it was one of those experiences of thinking, I understand the objectivist ethics. And then I read the book and said, all right, now I understand the objectivist ethics. And of course, as time went on, I realized there's still so much more to understand. But that book was a real turning point for me. So uh, eager to have Tara here. Her most recent book that I hope you guys have heard of, and I certainly encourage you to buy, it's really fantastic, and we'll talk a little bit about it, uh, is called Egoism Without Permission. And if you go to attendee services, you, there's actually a special discount available. It's a really good one. So please take advantage of it and uh, eager to hear what Tara has to say. Our next panelist, Gina Gorlin. Gina Gorlin has been around the movement uh, even longer than I have, uh, frankly, um, but just been a real amazing presence. But particularly in the last few years as she's spoken at Ocon, I think it's been some of the most powerful talks that have ever been given at Ocon's about how to use these ideas and use ideas from her background in psychology to live a great life. Because Gina is a, a, an associate professor of psychology or in the Department of Psychology at the University of Texas at Austin, does coaching with entrepreneurs, has an incredible substack called Building the Builders. And uh, I hope to hear more. Free from subscribes. Free <laughs> subscriptions. Um, can people pay if they really, really want to? I would welcome. <laughs> any support. <laughs> Great. And uh, Tal Safani, who uh, definitely should need no introduction by this <laughs> point, but he is the CEO of ARI, longtime entrepreneur, and um, for a few years now has been running what uh, I think you just did in a previous uh, session, happiness teams, where he's worked with, are we at hundreds? I know dozens, but probably close to hundreds of individuals now helping them really achieve happiness and uh, also co-teaches with me a class at Ayn Rand University called Philosophy Work in Business where we help students identify and pursue fulfilling careers and we're actually going to be doing a, uh, a session at Ocon that will give you a flavor from that class. So uh, please a hand for the panel and then we'll dive right in. So the way this is going to work is I'm going to ask everybody to give just a short opening statement of first thoughts on how to cash in an objectivism. Then we're going to have a, a, a panel discussion where I'll ask some questions for roughly half an hour, and then we'll take questions from you guys for the rest of the time and uh, questions from our online audience. So please be sure to send those in. And um, well, I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about how I think about this issue. And I mean, the way I think about it is if your life is not getting better from studying objectivism, something has gone terribly wrong. And I've always been haunted by a question that I've heard uh, John Allison, who many of you know, ask from time to time, which is why aren't more objectivists more happy? And if you're not finding that you're getting more happiness from objectivism, then the question is, well, why not? And how can I get more of it? 
Now, last year I gave a talk called How to Be an Earthly Idealist, where I explored a lot of how I think about this issue, and I encourage you guys to watch that. That talk was really emphasizing one kind of barrier to getting value from objectivism, and that is taking objectivism religiously. But there's another kind of mistake that objectivists often make, and that is the kind of flip side of taking it more in a subjective way. And in particular, the way that, that the subjectivism shows up is that it's unserious. Objectivism becomes more like a club. Oh, I meet with my friends who like Ayn Rand and we make in-jokes about, you know, A is A and whatever kind of bromides. But if you step back and look at the way that a person's living their life, it's indistinguishable from more conventional people, except for the fact that, you know, when they talk about politics, they say really shocking, surprising <laughs> things. And it, the, the, the real mark of this, the real test of it, is that when people face hard choices, you'll often see a kind of rationalization for why they're not going to take a principled stand. Ankar talked about, you know, the people say, I don't want to be a martyr uh, in his talk earlier, and how there is a real issue of you, there's no obligation to be a martyr. But very often what that means is I don't have the courage to take a principled stand. And often the reason I don't have the courage to um, reference something Ayn Rand once said is they don't see the ideas as clearly as they should. And so putting in the work to take the ideas seriously is to see the consequences of it and put it to work in your own life. And I'll just say that sociologically, um, when Gina and I were coming up, it was a really interesting era in the objectivist movement. And one thing that I think I remember talking to people about and probably talking to you about in those days is it, was, it felt like a healthier movement because a lot of the dogmatism that had been around was getting pushed out of the movement. And that really was true. But part of what happened in the McCaskey blow up is that there was a realization that I came to is it got replaced with a lot of subjectivism. There are a lot of, particularly the younger people that I saw, they did not take objectivism seriously. They thought it was fun, but not when it held them to high standards. And those people are, are no longer around. The, a word about how I think about what would go into taking objectivism seriously is on the one hand, and this is the point I stressed last year, objectivism is just about getting what you want. But it's also, and particularly morality, is about what's worth wanting. And that if you think about the fountainhead, so much of it is work. What's distinctive about him is he is a real clear, real rational, real powerful conception of what genuinely is worth wanting. And so when he turns down something that a, a job offer that he needs financially, in a sense, he has a clear view of that's not what I'm after. That's not what I want. And therefore, it's the most selfish thing you've ever seen somebody do to turn it down. And so to take, a, to take morality seriously, to take ideas seriously, I think is keeping in mind, yeah, I'm, I'm in this for what I want, but I'm very thoughtful and very attentive to what's worth wanting, and philosophy is a powerful guide to that. So a lot more to say, but I'll leave it at that and move on to Tara, if you could share your thoughts. Sure, thanks. So I'm going to put three ideas on the table for for the discussion, if people want to put, pick up on any of them, about how to cash in on objectivism. One has, to, so I'll just say the three, and then I'll elaborate a little bit on each. Personalize it, invest in people, other people, cultivate self-awareness. So personalize it. Egoism can't make you happy. Egoism is about how to, but you've got to supply the what for, right? You've got to figure out what are my specific values, right? The pursuit of happiness is the pursuit of values. And you were just saying a moment ago, like, you've got to figure out what's worth wanting. That's a, that's a serious enterprise, right, that you've got to be doing on an ongoing basis, figuring out what really are the things I care about. And that may change over time. You've got to be paying attention to this isn't giving me the satisfaction it gave me five years ago and so on. You've got to refine and prune and so on. But Pursuing your flourishing consists of the things that you enjoy doing, that you find worthwhile, you know, whether it's 
selling real estate or teaching kindergarten or homeschooling your kid or playing the guitar or restoring old cars, whatever. So personalize it to make it not, you know, self-interest is an abstraction. What's Gina's interest? What's Tal's interest? That's, that's the job for every person, okay? Second thing, invest in people. God, I could go on and on about how wonderful people are. Now, we all know there are clinkers, of course. You know, there's the bad Christmas sweater and all that amongst us. But people are the richest source of value in our lives. And think about how much, how rewarding other people can be. People we know not all that well. People we know very well. Tristan this morning gave a really good lecture, I thought, on friendship and some of the kind of value you get from that. Um, so a couple of thoughts here on, on people. Cultivate, like make it a point, to cultivate positive relationships of different sorts with other people. Aim to upgrade the quality of people you hang out with, you associate with. Um, beware of the company you keep. People rub off on you, even in subtle ways. And, you know, we hear that about, oh, you know, they'll have a bad influence on you. When you play with the kids who are a little bit better than you, over time, you can become better too. You might know this phenomenon from sports, right? You play, you know, the tennis player who plays consistently with the person who's a little bit better than him will tend to elevate his game in all realms. I think just surrounding yourself as much as you can with the better quality people. So be discriminating on, on that score. Um, make overtures to find new people. Right? And I mean, you might be very happy with a lot of the good friends and relationships that you have, work relationships and so on, but be on the lookout because, and you know, it won't always work out or they may not be that interested or even if you do then, you know, have a dinner or two with them, you might find, no, oh, the chemistry is not right or they're not as interesting as I thought they were, but take that chance, even though it might be uncomfortable, because man, when you find a good, a good person, and even if it's just, man, we get to talk about, I don't know, the Philadelphia Phillies or whatever he like. like. But even when there's just one shared value, like, isn't, I mean, can't that be enormously rewarding? I, again, I could go on and on about people, but let me stop. Um, so the third thing, cultivate self-awareness. Singing my song. Um, yeah, no, I know, I'm singing Gina's song, but Gina's really good on this. Uh, you know, in doing anything, in any job, you need to know what materials do I have? What are my resources? What are my tools? Well, my job, like my job, I want to make myself happy. That's a big job. I need to know myself. I'm one of the crucial tools here. I'm the agent. So the more you can understand yourself by steadily introspecting, asking, why would you do that? Why do you feel this way? Um, you know, what do you feel? When you do that consistently over time, you can see recurring patterns. You can get to know your own tendencies in ways that can help you deal better with, with problems. In the I mean, I'm much better at handling stress than I used to be. It's not like it's all dissolved, but because I understand certain of my ways and reactions, you can respond to certain things differently, more effectively. I think I've probably taken too much time as it is, so let me stop there and we can talk about this or whatever. Gina? I, I don't know if you've set me up so well, the two of you have stolen all of my thunder, but actually this feels like a great opportunity because you're um, building on some of the points that I had in mind and then I, um, I want to build a little bit further. So Don, when you mentioned that you and I came into the movement at a point where the dogmatism had really been uh, largely weeded out, but then there was this influx of unseriousness, I'm gonna drop my pen, subjectivism. I think, I mean, your formulation of that actually made something click for me as I was hearing you say that, which is a connection to something I've really been on about and that's really shaped my career in recent years, which is a concern about ambitiousness and what I see as a, a dearth of ambitiousness, both within the movement and in uh, the larger world, which I think you know has interesting parallels where I think we read Rand, we, do, we discover objectivism, and there's this sense that it's meant to do a lot of work for us. Like now we're meant to be, now we know the true way to live. Now we have access to, it, like, to these virtues and we can recite the correct you know, ideology. So things should fall into place for us. And then 
when things don't fall into place, then we start to pathologize ourselves. Something must be wrong. You know, maybe it's my duty premise. Maybe it's my, uh, you know, secondhandedness. Maybe, and yeah, likely, you, you know, you're struggling with a mix of those things, but not because something's wrong with you, because by default, we don't amount to much. By default, we don't understand the ideas that we've imbibed. By default, we're rationalistic and we're mediocre. And, and the work has to happen if, subsequent to the inspiration and, and sort of the newfound clarity of objectivism. And so what's really excited me in recent years has been working with the most ambitious builders, as I've been, as I've branded them, working with not necessarily, but for the most part in recent years, I haven't been working with objectivists. And that's been kind of an intentional choice because I want to learn from the most impressive achievers. I want to understand what makes them tick. I want to see how it is that even without explicitly understanding all these ideas, without having, uh, you know, cast off duty premises and false dichotomies, which i encounter in my coaching of them, they've still managed to build these incredible companies that you know, like most of us haven't been able to build, <laughs> right? And to really understand like, what, is, what is the earned wisdom and what are the hard-won you know, principles and practices that actually power real and personalized, you know, kind of in this world, productive achievement? And how does objectivism then supercharge that? You know, and, and the more I've been working with these really ambitious people, the more I've come to appreciate. You know, I wrote a piece at one point for my Substack called Death is the Default. And I just keep coming back and every, it's like in psychology, there's you know, this phenomenon, um, Bader Meinhof, I think they're the German you know, co-authors where once you've encountered something, you just you keep seeing it everywhere. But I really think it's everywhere. The, insight, this unlocking insight that by default, you know, entropy is the default, chaos is the default, the world does, it's a benevolent universe in the sense that it makes sense, it's causal, we can, we have agency to, to solve our problems, to move the needle on our, uh, you know, on medicine, on technology, on psychology, on our human thriving, but none of it's handed to us on a silver platter, and it's all really hard to build, and by default it sucks, and the, the first several iterations inevitably suck. By default we're ignorant, and it's not by, it, it doesn't require great vice or great kind of um, human failing to just get it wrong and to struggle and to misstep, even when you have objectivism, in some ways in particular, because it gives you this false expectation that now things should be easier, and they're just not. And so I really want to be a voice of both a, a call to ambitiousness, and I think part of what that requires is normalizing, understanding the fact that, yeah, we're not going to start out, uh, 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 we're not going to be Howard Rourke's, <laughs> to become a Howard Rourke, or to become our own, to build our own personalized version of an ambitious ideal life, is going to take work, and the work is part of the glory of the enterprise. And so, yeah, I just, I, I wanna maybe return as we uh, ask questions of ourselves and each other, return to the question of what can we learn from the most ambitious achievers, objectivist or not? Tao. Yeah, <clears throat> for me, uh, the theme was really interesting because it's cashing in on objectivism. And I reflected on the fact that in the first, I would say um, almost a year of being exposed to objectivism, uh, it detracted from my happiness. I was accumulating debt. I was not cashing in. Because the first uh, response that I had, and maybe because it was later in my life, is that I thought, I, you know, the way I absorbed it was dogmatic. Now there's a, a new way of understanding the world, and everybody's wrong. Now I'm right about everything, everybody's wrong about it, and I destroyed relationships, and I uh, had... Uh, in, you know, completely inefficient discussions with people. I started hating my job. I started hating, you know, people that, uh, that and, and I realized several months in, it's like, this is not what it's for. It's not about 
oh, now I know how politics should be and the laissez-faire capitalism is the right way to go. And I realized, uh, I remember actually the introspection session where I said, I got, I'm getting this all wrong because this should be a blueprint for me living a better life. And I started realizing the, the amount of work that I need to do in order to uh, cash in or, or improve my life. And it was a whole journey that I had to go through with uh, understanding of, of insights and integrations uh, that I think uh, we don't get. I, I, still, I, I didn't get from the fiction. Uh, even from the nonfiction of, okay, what does this all mean? It feels like this is the right physics to build your engineering on. But what kind of engineering am I going to build? I'm going to be a rocket engineer or a software engineer. Is that, it goes to the point of personalization. What is the Howard Rourke in me? What, 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 what is my architecture? I'm going to... And I've, the, the reason why it was so hard in the beginning because it was realizing in the middle of your life, it's not what I'm doing. Right? It needs to be something else. And just the... the Again, the work and the hard decision that I had to make in order to change course. And it was a process of slowly um, digesting, personalizing, and understanding that at the, at the end of, of it all, it's, it's, a, it's a philosophy that guides you towards self-understanding, self-discovery. Of uh, a lot of introspective uh, uh, you know, work that you need to do in order to answer the question, who am I and what do I want? And uh, I always say that, you know, the, the first scene of the fountainhead, you see someone who knows exactly who he is and what he wants. And my question was always, how did he get there? And again, that's the, that's the journey that I had to go through in order to start cashing in. And I have to say, I, had, I have to go through like a, almost like a valley of despair in order to emerge on the other side of it to start cashing in on a lot of work that I had to do. Um, and I'm trying to distill it, uh, even today, to, to, to what does it mean and, and a lot of the uh, applications of objectivism into making your life the, uh, more than it uh, could have been without it. And I think that there are people out there that I think Gina was referring to that don't know how to spell objectivism, but just um, are living amazing lives because they've figured out the kind of sense of life the centrality of values, of introspective understanding of who they are and what they want, and the uncompromising attitude towards what they want to achieve, and, uh, and the centrality of values in one's life. Uh, and I see other people who can recite conceptually all of the right uh, concepts and, and you know, uh, ideas, philosophical ideas, but have no idea how to make the connection between those abstractions to their lives sometimes because of psychological issues or just a lack of an understanding of how to apply those principles in, into building a, li a life. So the, I'm sure there's more to say, but for me, uh, the, the essence of objectivism is to translate it towards decisions that you make about what to pursue, how to pursue it, how to gain the self-esteem and uh, achieving the values that you know, would make you ha a happy person. Great. So I have uh, some follow-up questions of my own. I'm going to direct them to individuals, but the rest of the panel feel free to jump in, but don't feel obligated that, you know, all of us have to answer everything. Um, but I want to start with um, Tal spoke a little bit about some of the personal challenges that you found in, in, in implementing these ideas. Maybe, Terry, you could speak to, you know, as somebody who has really gone deep in, into the philosophy itself, what were some of the things that you found challenging about implementing this in your life? That I had internalized, you, you internalize a lot of bad ideas growing up in the culture that we grow up in. So that I think even after, oh, I subscribe to objectivism. Like, oh, I get this, this is good, this is great. I think it's one thing to accept these great new ideas, but it's another to expel the old poisons from your system, and they can, I mean, they can really be tenacious. So for me, I know, like, they have been very tenacious. And you find them in unexpected ways and, and you know, just popping in. But actually, it's from a lot of introspection and kind of studying of what's going wrong. Why do I still feel pulled to do this when I know that's really stupid? <laughs> but it's because some part of you doesn't know it's really stupid. But it's only from having those conversations with yourself frequently. Um, so I think 
like one of the big challenges for a lot of people is we just normally internalize and the defaults in our culture will reinforce the altruism, the collectivism, the you've always got to root for the underdog, the underdogs, or it's always compassion. That's always good in all circumstances. And you're not supposed to judge people. And all. So just elements of that, I think, can really creep in and, and then, you know, to some extent have for me. And it's been the greater ability to liberate myself from that stuff that's been really helpful. Well, I can go on and on about all the things I had to kind of get out of my system in order to... Uh, I think um, if I have to point to the thing I had to get used to, it's that my life is mine. What does it mean to wake up every day and understand that my life is mine to build? It's my story. It's whatever story I'm going to write is going to be my life. And it starts from that. It doesn't start from my family. It doesn't start from what I'm expected to do. It doesn't start from how, money is in the, how much money is in the bank. All of the things that I was trained to think are the purposes, right? And uh, to get it out of your system took a long while. And um, it, it, won it took me several kind of cycles to really grasp um, the centrality, again, of, of, uh, of values, to, to reduce everything. For me, Atlas Shrugged, which was the first book I read, opened the door. But, but the real meal was, was Howard Rourke showing me what a life centered around a central purpose and an uncompromising attitude towards understanding what those are, the things that bring meaning to your life. Um, I, I really needed to reclaim th this, this notion that my life is mine. And the meaning of that sentence is that my values are mine. They need to be consciously chosen be, be authentically mine and not second-handed. And then I, what I think I did well in the 20 years that where I, I was an adult and didn't know objectivism is to learn how to do things. And this is why I feel like today I'm in, in like one, one foot in what I was trained to do, which is to build things and to do things and to be concrete and pragmatic and just break the walls and always find a solution. And then in the second part of my life, like, it was like getting the perspective. Why, why am we doing all of this, you know? So, um, and what I became really excited about, my passion is to take those abstract, abstract ideas and have this, you know, the, the idea of an entrepreneur taking ownership and uh, pushing through challenges, in, including internal challenges and emotional challenges of like, I don't feel like a fear of failure and ridicule and so on, and pushing through this and, and being biased for action and so on. So, um, you know, there, there's a lot I had to deal with. I would say the second thing that I've learned that uh, I really had to change my whole understanding was how to manage emotions, how to, to understand the role of emotions. And uh, I mean, if you ask me what was the one thing that I took uh, from Rand and from Leonard and from Harry that immediately had an impact in my life and, and increased my level of happiness is to understand what is that thing that washes over me, the anxiety, the joy, all, where is it coming from and what is the mechanism by which it works? And to kind of reflect and you know, like, I can control this thing, right? I can go back behind the emotion and understand my... So uh, that is another big thing that I took uh, that, that I had to integrate and then master over, over the, the years of being more efficient, by the way, in, in cashing in on objectivism. Yeah. So, Tal and Gina, you both touched on this fact that there's people in the world who you look at them, you know, they've never heard of objectivism, or certainly they're not objectivists, but in certain respects, man, do they know how to live. Like, they, like they have something really to, to teach us that like, they're kind of illustrating the ideas in certain ways, whether they know it or not. And, and at one level, that's not a surprise, right? Like Galt makes this point of, um, you know, any moment of happiness you've known has been from living on my morality. Like the, the Ayn Rand's trying to capture and put into principles what a consistent pro-life way of living is. But I wonder, Gina, if you have a view of what, what is the thing that people like that are often missing that objectivism does provide? Like what, what given that there are things we can learn from them, like what is the supercharging that comes from having and studying an explicit philosophy? Yeah. That's a great question. 
um, there are a few contenders because I rotate through focusing on a few different common themes that come up in my coaching of entrepreneurs. And I would say the emergent themes uh, to your question of where does objectivism offer a level up um, would be just, uh, maybe not surprisingly, but the moral clarity, the valorization of what they're doing as good. And that has such deep through lines and sort of deep implications for just day-to-day -day decision making, for being willing to say no to a, a venture capitalist, a deal with an investor that would kind of undervalue their company, even though their advisors say, come on, just take it, you know, so that you can get back to work. Do you really, you know, want to, like, kind of like who are you to be holding your head up high when this is, it's just money at the end of the day? Is this really what it's about for you? Like, yeah, it's a big part of what this is about for me. I want to be, I want this to be a globally impactful company. I believe that it can be. I'm doing the work to drive that level of impact. And yeah, I want to cash in. And part of the reason that I'm putting myself through this incredible ordeal that no one understands till they've been in it and through it is that I want capital and I want to be able to really influence the institutions that I care about. You know, and I want to build the life that I want on, a, on the scale that matters to me. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna set the bar high. And that's not mercenary. That's not, this, you know, that's not petty. That's, like, that's me taking my life seriously. And it's respect worthy. It's not going to knock me down a peg. And, and so many of the assumptions that founders have around sort of how they will be viewed, at, which you know, there's some foundation in reality because you know, money making and material ambition, uh, capitalistic kind of ventures get a lot of awful, unearned flack, right? And negative kind of press in our culture. But ultimately, at the level of individual kind of human-to-human -human interaction, it turns out that you gain respect from all the people who matter, from your employees to your investors to you know, all the kind of relevant to other founders who are looking up to you. You actually gain respect rather than lose respect when you stand up for yourself, when you take yourself seriously, when you take your mission seriously, when you have the hard conversation with the employee who's not quite cutting it, even though you're terrified of how it's going to go and are they going to lash out and will my whole company just walk out on me? But no, this is the right thing for me, for my company. I need to get a certain amount of stuff done at, on, at, on certain really ambitious milestones and this person, you know, bless them. I didn't hire appropriately. I overestimated, you know, their training, their expertise, and I'm going to have to let them go. And the conversations consistently surprise the founders insofar as when you do that kind of conversation, well, when you approach it selfishly, when you approach it as a win-win, kind of like, look, either both of us are gaining value in this relationship or both of us are losing. I don't want to be either exploiter or exploited. And you're languishing in this role because... Uh, you're, you're not able to deliver on you know, kind of what the company's needs are. The conversation ends up actually elevating both people. They, you know, people end up on better terms. People end up actually reinvigorated for their job search because their employer actually respected them enough you know, to have that kind of honest conversation. And because they can see, that, wow, like you're willing to do the hard thing. You're will, like you're, you know, you teared up with me in this conversation. This is not easy for you, but it was important enough for you to do and for you to do right because of how much you value your life and your work. And now, you know, now I'm going to go and level up. So that's one of the biggest things. And just to be able to really make explicit, like, what do you mean it's petty? What do you mean it's mercenary? It's fucking heroic <laughs> what you're doing. And to really be able to, to yet yeah, to valorize product object just one or two things just a couple of quick comments in Absolutely. there so i mean in part it sounds like an exertion of independence on the person like i'm going by my judgment i know there are all these doubters and and people yeah. who would disagree or who would 
I don't care. But, but they're really good at that. Independent. Like, that's what they bring to the table. Yeah, no, that, know, the yeah. No, is, no, what is also, I mean, there's the that? justice in what you yeah. said of the evaluating the employee when it's got to be negative. So, I mean, they are practicing some of these virtues, but yeah. it does seem very driven by the, because I know what I want. I know what I'm after in the end, big picture. But I would also think, just an additional thing, um, it's that release of guilt for, for being right. successful right. or for seeking money and so on that, again, we see in so many of the the students who are in business schools, but apologetic because they're going into the business schools and so yeah. on. So that's just another dimension of all yeah. this. Yeah, and, and yeah, and the other theme, and I promise then I'll, you know, I'll let us move to the next question, but work-life balance, kind of all these perceived kind of trade-offs and conflicts between my work and my life. If you even think about the premise, so there's your life and then there's your work and your work isn't part of your life and then what is it exactly? Like it's relegated to this kind of like side thing you have to do until you don't have to anymore. You know, so to, when I am able to bring the, uh, my, my conception of work as soul building, as, the, as our noblest activity, you know, as the kinds of beings that we are, as the basis for... The, for creating ourselves and for kind of forming the style of personality, forming the value system that then provides a context for all of our relationships, for our parenting, for our recreation, to be able to bring that kind of rich, robust, kind of ethical conception of work and its role in your life, which actually then helps builders, you know, helps entrepreneurs think more seriously both about work and about life. Because rather than either burning out at work because they view it as this kind of duty, this impersonal duty, they've forgotten why they ever even chose this particular, you know, well, it's too late, I'm already, you know, in for a penny, in for a pound, I've got to see it through, but I hate it. But that's fine that I hate it, it's not about me, you know, it's about the company, which is shockingly not a sustainable solution to, you know, um, motivating great work. Or on the flip side, for disregarding and compartmentalizing away personal relationships, friendships, and just pouring themselves into work, but in a myopic way. Like both of those mistakes, both of, both of those error modes, that come from a dichotomized and kind of non-holistic, non-organismic understanding of human life, where either work is like a petty means to some nobler end, or work is... It is this Kantian imperative outside the context of a life and a, and a pursuit of joy toward which that work is channeled. So uh, in, a, in about five minutes or so, we're going to go to your questions, so make sure you're thinking them. Uh, Tara, one question I wanted to ask you. What do you see as, where can objectivist intellectuals be helpful going forward? What are some opportunities to help people uh, one one that occurred to me today, I was talking um, to Aaron Smith from ARI about some of the challenges people have in applying principles to their own life. And I thought, well, that's understandable. It's really hard. And we don't talk a lot about, we say, oh, that's an issue of application. Okay, well, what's the guidance and, and how to apply? So that's, that's one that I'd like to see us do more is uh -huh. really working through application indeed. Yeah. A lot of what Tal and I are doing in philosophy work in business is like applying the principle of center your life around a productive career and say, well, okay, well, how do I do that? Um, but what are your thoughts on opportunities where, where we can be more helpful? Right. So this was one of the questions I didn't like, but I have things to say. <laughs> but I also thought, but it's good to have some questions, you know, like you could disagree about what you'd like. So there's a way of taking the question of like, what or at least the way it was put in writing in advance, um, like what should objectivist intellectuals be doing to help people more? And I thought, well, I'm not a public service institution. I'm not here to help you. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I really do hope my work, I mean, there's nothing, no, I mean, you. you know. Indeed. There's nothing more gratifying than hearing that your work helps people. Like, I love that. But it's like, I might have to figure out how to help you. But um, so far as we <laughs> want to be creating objective values for people who we value. Mm -hmm. So one thing that I had thought was, um, but I think you raised a really interesting point about the how-to of application. Maybe we can come back to that later. But um, I think one thing that really helpful objectivist intellectuals do is they listen carefully to the questions that people are asking. 
And I don't mean simply on a one eye, like listen carefully when there's the next question, but like over time, mm -hmm. you're paying attention to what are the recurring confusions or different premises that people seem to have so that then you can identify those and address those. And I think this morning we saw a wonderful example of that in Ankar's lecture. He had been noticing over time, gee, when people talk about this issue of sanction, they're talking about it in a really different way than I am, right? And he, but I mean, he was paying, it's like, what's going on here? What's going, he didn't do that in a month. That wasn't one of his last, you know, last minute. He's been thinking about that for a long time, but by being very attuned, very observant to what are the confusions and questions and how am I taking this differently? And is there something wrong with the way I'm taking it? And he ended up giving a really, I think, very helpful clarification of these different ways of, of approaching that whole issue. So I think being observant, of people's confusions, but here again I'll say, including one's own confusions, mm -hmm. which is where the intro, it's like, what aspect of that can I not explain? Or where am I a little bit confused or feel some ambivalence about something? So you want to be building on being as specific as you can be in trying to understand what's going wrong such that you might be able to address that. And I think this even relates to your issue of how to apply the principle. Okay, well, the more granular you can be in trying to identify what are the problems, what are the hiccups? Why am I having a problem applying this? I say the right thing, but damn it, I'm, you know. So specificity, being observant, those kinds of things I think can help. Well, great. Uh, so the last question I wanted to ask, because I know we've all either written recently or in the process of writing books, tackling these kinds of issues in our own way. And uh, this is a great opportunity to pitch your work, but also just, you know, th there's a way in which we're already on this track of trying to do things that are helpful to people trying to live by a philosophy. So Tal, maybe I'll start with you. Um, maybe there's something to, that to, you want to keep quiet because yeah. it's still in progress, but... <laughs> It's an opportunity to promote a book, but it's also pressure to finish it, right? It's, uh, well, then that's a positive. Win-win. <laughs> <that's win. win. laughs> pressure, so. pressure. Um, yeah, my, uh, my passion right now is to, to create a path of what does it look like to pursue, objectively pursue your happiness. So take, you know, building on all of, all of the objectivist concepts, but trying to inter interpret that into a systematic application of, of those concepts of central purpose and value. What is the value? And then um, the, the real challenge of, of the limited time and effort, uh, sorry, limited time and energy that you have in prioritizing, understanding what's more important, what type of values are we dealing with? I've found kind of four domains of values and things. Like that. All of that, what, what comes from understanding, and, and Leonard Peikoff, by the way, was the, the person who with his, uh, you know, uh, radio shows and, 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 and podcasts al always showed me. And I was like, okay, you understand all this? Good. Now let's see if you really understand this. By So what I would do is, you know, I would add, pause after somebody asked the question or Leonard would read it. It's like, how would I answer this? And I saw that there's a lot of gap that I had in not just understanding the concept, but the applications of the concept. How would you approach this? And so I've dedicated over a decade to thinking about what have I done that was successful and not so successful, and I'm trying to reduce it into uh, something that, you know, someone uh, who will potentially read and, and, and make less errors than I've done in the process of defining, prioritizing, categorizing, and then effectively um, concretizing and materializing the, the values, because at the end of the day, this is what it's all for. And actually, my, the last chapter that I have a lot of issues with is cashing in, which is what this is all. I think, and I see a lot of people, especially with my non-objectivist friends, when they do the whole cycle of defining, concretizing, pursuing, achieving, but never cashing out. Mm -hmm. Because it requires an introspective mind that says, okay, what is this all for? And how do I extract the, you know, the golden coins of self-esteem out of everything that I've done? Even that is an effort mm -hmm. by itself. So um, my, the book I'm writing is, is, is almost like a how-to guidebook of, uh, based on an objectivist principle of achieving one's happiness. Gina? I go. Okay, so my book in progress uh, is based on my substack. So there's not a great deal of mystery there. You can read 
the preview of the book by reading Building the Builders, um, but the overarching kind of theme and aim, uh, the, my current working subtitle is a psychology, so the title is A Builder's Mindset, A New Psychology of Ambition. And so I mentioned that I've really been over-indexing on ambition, as they say in the you know, founder circles. Um, and it's a, an integration of what I've learned through the decades of study of psychology on the one hand. So really, objectivism laying a foundation for everything I've done since I was 16. And I think I was 16 or 17 when I started the OAC. It was like the second year of the, of the first iteration of the program. So it's, you know, philosophy has always, uh, and objectivism specifically, has been part of the picture for me from very early on. But the extent to which I've gained and sort of deepened my understanding of objectivism and of you know, what is evasion and how is it different from, from focus and from drift and how does, it, it, uh, how does it manifest when we're feeling really depressed and beating ourselves up and internalizing versus when we're uh, 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 kind of playing the Zen master or the victim and kind of the, and externalizing blame responsibility and what are all the sneaky ways that our premises uh, 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 push on our thinking and create blind spots for us. Psychology has really provided the depth and sort of the nuance of understanding and the detailed causal mechanisms for me to then be able to go and apply objectivism better. And, and then the study of entrepreneurs. So my domain expertise has sort of extended to academic psychology, which I'll be previewing a little bit tomorrow for those coming to my little intro psych sampler. And then this in more informal, but really kind of richly personalized study of ambitious entrepreneurs. And what those, those three pillars, you know, philosophy, psychology, founders, kind of what those have taught me about the work of building ourselves insofar as we really want to set our aims high and to define our ambitious ideal, not in terms of some stale conventional, not in the Keating-esque kind of way, you know, but in a Rourkean kind of way in that I don't want to be Rourke, I want to be me. So, you know, who's that going to be? And how do I go and, uh, and kind of run at things in the world to really to build that unique conception of me. Tara. Um, I'll try to be really brief. So, you know, I had previously written a book on Ayn Rand's account of the virtues, and that tells you how to be moral, you know, be honest, be just, be productive, and so on. But what I came to realize over time since is that, and I mean, I think I knew this a little bit, but there are still things that go on for us subconsciously, psychologically, that can get in the way of our practice of egoism, even when we fully mean to be egoists. And we're smart people, and we're experienced people, and so on. So I wanted to explore more of those sorts of interstitial uh, bugs that might be in there, and go beyond the virtues in that way. So in that sense, too, this book was much more inductive for me. Instead of just I wasn't building on things that Leonard Peikoff and Ayn Rand had written in the same way. I mean, I'm definitely building on their ideas, but um, it was more just based on observation of myself and of other people. So it's a more psychological work in some respects. Um, I'll leave it at that, but you'll have to read And I will talk a little bit more about it in my talk on uh, What's your Monday. next book, Don? <laughs> <laughs> well, the last one, uh, Effective Egoism. I... I had this question of, you know, if I met like a young Bill Gates, if I met a young builder and I wanted to introduce them to objectivism, but they didn't, they wouldn't read fiction, so I couldn't give them Atlas Shrugged. And let's say like they're not interested in philosophy. Well, like what's the book that I would hand that person who, that I think would really connect with them and would connect with them today in our culture with the particular arguments and particular concerns that people have? And, and so I thought, all right, that, that's the kind of book that I want to write. And so effective egoism is really, it's a case for people who want to be happy. And it's a book of philosophy, but it goes beyond philosophy. So a lot of what I'm concerned with is not just to take the example of productiveness. What philosophy tells you is build your life around a productive career. How do you do that? How do you decide what career you want? How do you pursue success? And so it's I think of it not as like the objectivist take, but an objectivist thinking about how to pursue happiness and sharing 
some of his ideas with you. And so I wanted to, to have that kind of quality, and I wanted to have a really personal quality. I tried to use a lot of personal examples because sometimes philosophy can feel like somebody's wagging a finger at you and saying, this is the way the world works. And what I wanted to get across was I've benefited so much by consulting a philosophic framework, and I've also learned a lot of lessons by when I didn't really consult a philosophic framework. And so that it, it, I want to just give people a guided tour um, from somebody deeply interested in philosophy, uh, g- give them the kind of basic framework and particularly the moral framework that I found just really, I want to say life-changing. I discovered it at 15, so there wasn't much to change. <laughs> but really, <laughs> like my awakening as a thinker and, and a valuer, um, share that with people. And, and, and so that was the real aim to um, not sell people on objectivism, but take people who are interested in happiness and sell them on the whole issue of philosophy and morality and obviously make the case for a pro-self, pro-happiness morality. So with that, if you guys want to line up and start asking your questions, we'd love to hear them. It can be anything we've talked about or anything that falls under this umbrella. So it just has to be relevant to objectivism, <laughs> happiness, life, and <laughs> Uh oh. Good luck. And if anybody is off topic, <laughs> I'll congratulate you. Yeah, cut you off. Go ahead. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, do you guys have any advice on how to not internalize negative premises, negative points of view, um, when you might have a lot of mixed cases and it's hard to separate things? What do you mean by not internalizing them? Andrew Huberman, for example, had a couple of really interesting talks. He's a neuroscientist, and um, he talked with David Goggins, a very accomplished uh, uh, Navy SEAL and athlete. And the takeaway was from it, uh, all stick, no carrot, because it grows your mid-cingulate. It makes you more tenacious. That's right out of Kant and completely uh, getting rid of what he would call, would call a, a hypothetical imperative in favor of a categorical imperative and what I think Dr. Gorlin would call... Um, like the, um, the drill sergeant? Yeah, the drill sergeant. And then in addition to that, um, <laughs> there was another talk he gave, uh, Stress is Enhancing Mindset, which is also very con. It's saying, insofar as you're frustrated because your schema is entirely invalid, is the extent to which you're going to learn and grow, which I've found in entry-level engineering and in school that's very true because they're going to put all sorts of ideas your way that are very specialized that are completely transgressive against metaphysics like objectivist metaphysics and things like that. So these are obviously very helpful specialized takes from very accomplished people from neuroscience to athletics or um, being a Navy SEAL, but I have a hard time reconciling that um, with say the objectivist metaphysics which really has nothing to do with those things, hence why I'm thinking about it in terms of comp. But, Anyway, that's a very highly specialized version of how do you not internalize bad premises when oftentimes very successful people have bad premises packaged with really good things, to Dr. Gorlin's point. Can I take a, an initial stab at this? So I think part of, what's, part of what we're reacting to perhaps in the question is that there's not going to be a general solution to the problem you're describing. And... I mean, if we take any of these individuals, I mean, at a certain level, you know, there's a whole psychology of how do you both become aware of and uproot negative premises, or you, know, you can build resilience against certain particular premises that you know you're vulnerable to. But, but the problem that there's all kinds of bad premises out in the culture, and they're often packaged together with really great insights, and they're getting something right, but something wrong, that it's the whole problem of... Uh, epistemology, right? It's the whole problem that, you know, when I say death is the default, yeah, bad thinking is the default, package deals are the default, and it's sort of our, the work is in really actively, critically engaging with each new idea framework we encounter and learning the kind of metacognitive skills of checking in with ourselves, asking ourselves, what are my blind spots here? You know, what am I drinking in with, you know, the or what babies am I throwing out with the bathwater, right? So to take any of the examples you mentioned, I, I'm more familiar with some than others, but you know, when I formulated this drill sergeant and master kind of framework and the builder as the third alternative, I was responding, as you were mentioning, Don, Don, Don uh, <laughs> calling you, to specific cultural 
debates and, uh, and arguments that I know have captured today. And stoicism is one that sort of appeared in a bunch of different guises and has this, had this kind of resurgence in that sort of, I know, Silicon Valley culture and in parts of academia. And I think part of the draw is that, yeah, like there are certain, there's, people have a need for a, an account of discipline and perseverance and endurance toward a long-term ideal, right? People, uh, they're, they're longing for an idealistic framework, right? They're longing for that kind of inspiration. And what they, and the form in which that need gets fulfilled is this form you know, that throws out the self with the bathwater, in effect, right? That throws out, it sort of like detaches the process from the aim, insofar as the aim is, because well, I actually want this for my life, and this will somehow bring me joy, and I don't have to choose this particular brand of you know, disciplined uh, uh, goal pursuit. I could go pursue something else that I actually like better, or that you know, is more worth it to me in the end, right? And so I'm really trying to engage with that but mindset by, rather than either noticing, look, people tend to fall into one or the other of these camps, and sometimes they toggle back and forth between them, where like neither fully satisfies. What I've done is I've offered them a third alternative that explicitly speaks to both needs, right? It explicitly speaks to like, yeah, sometimes you're going to need to do things you hate doing, and sometimes it's going to be a grind. And, you know, I think my pinned tweet right now is there are two core competencies that you need both in order to kind of pursue your bliss, otherwise you're screwed. And one is doing hard, unpleasant things. And two is refusing to do hard, unpleasant things that aren't worth it. You know, what was one without two is martyrdom. Two without one is, I don't remember how I put it, is ineffectual, helpless. You know, then you're never going to get anything done. And, but that's me addressing this one very culturally specific manifestation of ideas that we know have been resurging, have been appearing in different guises through history. So you sort of have to do that afresh with each new guise. But you have to do that constantly. So yeah. I think, like, just one general comment is, the master virtue is rationality. Rationality is hard yeah. work. It's just and hard. It's ongoing work. It's, it's, but it's like, it takes vigilance. You've got, so, yeah. And again, living in our society, so many bad ideas come in. With some mi the good ones mixed in, as you say, like the package deals. So, but you've got to be aware of that phenomenon in general, so that when you have that, res that sounds good. But there's this little thing in my mind that has a little grain of doubt about it. You've got to follow up on that, right? Whether tonight or tomorrow. But you thought, oh, but there's some question I have about that, and I've got to pursue that. So you just have to be, I think, vigilant about being actively, purposefully rational in trying to understand the ideas, so that yeah. you know. And some are going to get in, but this is why the ongoing thinking about things, then you can catch them later. Oh, yeah. I, I bought into that. Yeah, and, and not to pick on, and this last thought on this, to just wrap up what you're saying, Tara, uh, not to pick on you in particular, because I actually, I think this is a good and well-formulated question. I'm glad you're asking it. I think it's broadly going to resonate. When we find ourselves asking, how do we make this not a problem for us anymore. Like, how do we, like, what's the general answer to the fact that sometimes we internalize bad premises? We should check the premise. <laughs> like, check the, wait, is it ever, so, like, is it supposed to be easy? Is there supposed to be a one size fits all? So, like, is there a world where I just don't have to be on the lookout for that anymore? I don't think there is. Yeah, no, just one thing to be wary of. This is a mistake a lot of people make, and the culture, particularly as it gets more tribal, pushes us in this direction is that our way that we process these things is David Goggins, good guy or bad guy? Am I on his side or am I not on his side? And that, but that's the wrong question, right? It's like, what does he get right? What does he get wrong? What do I agree with? What do I disagree with? There is a question then of like, well, if I'm going to, um, am I going to share a stage with him or am I going to recommend his book to people? There can be sub questions that take a more global evaluation, but that's not the starting point and that's not the primary. Um, usually we, we, we tell the audience members, keep your questions short. I'm going to say to us, the panelists, <laughs> let's try to keep our answers a little snappier you, so that we can get through. But thanks oh, for the question. Good call. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, hi, thank you for the discussion. Uh, I have a question connected with a relationship and exercising ambition. Um, as you said, um, 
it's common theme about like work and balance that uh, work life balance that I don't necessarily like myself. And my question is about like methods of building personal relationship, whether it's family, uh, friends, or romantic relationships, that helps us, that helps us um, build up uh, on like ex exercising our ambition hmm. and like building our professional life, and also like work on this relationship that not necessarily uh, affect our exercising our ambition positively. Mm -hmm. So, I don't follow the question. Could you try to maybe restate it a little bit differently? Unless, did, did Can, is it what's an approach for building personal relationships if you want generally to be ambitious about your life? Oh uh, yes, I think you, you, you can. Is that it? it have a, yes. Yeah, I mean, Whatever. obviously, there's going to be way more to say on that than we'll be able to say it in our brief uh, response. Um, I'll say one thing, and then. Feel free to just actually, you know, interrupt me after two minutes. But there's a popular heuristic in just the general culture that you are the five people you spend the most time with. And I think there's deep, deep truth captured in that heuristic that we are, we imbibe, you know, to the point of how do we not internalize bad promises as well. What we engage with and who we get visibility from, who elicits, you know, what parts of us and draws out kind of what aspects of our personality and our work really helps shape who we become. And our choice, you know, one of the major points of our influence over our own lives is who we choose to bring into our lives and kind of how we choose to spend time with the important people in our lives. So that's one thing just to think about is who are you surrounding yourself with and what are they inspiring in you? Do they level you up or do they comfort, you know, do they make it easier to stagnate or do they make it harder to stagnate and easier to grow? So I would just add yeah. one thing. If I understood, if I understood the, the questions correctly, the chosen relationships, the romantic and the friendships specifically, um, if you feel, for me, if I feel like they're contributing to the, my central purpose by adding more um, you know, energy, mod motivation, support, um, then I know that something's really right. And when I felt like specific, specifically friendships uh, were detracting from it, I knew that something was wrong. And it, so there, there is a lot to think about and more, but, but I would say that's, that's my criteria of knowing that it's, a, it's something that supports my life. Two quick things. You want to be with a person romantically who gets you and what's really important to you and what's really valuable to you. And if they can't sign on to your level of ambition about the things that you value, then that's not good. The other thing I would say is you want to be careful that you, like, do you, how serious are you about this other person in this relationship? Is that just, well, you know, you're supposed to have a relationship and yeah, I kind of like certain aspects of it. But I'm really, I don't care that much about like her. Like, you want to be sure that you're being honest about how, like, because if you really value this person and that relationship, then you, it does, you need to invest in that as well as whatever the, the career ambition or something like that. Okay, thank you. Hi. Um, one aspect of Rand's ideas that I really liked is that she reconciled in a very efficient way um, tr objective truth and morality, and that they're not, in fact, these dialectics, but they can even be one and the same thing. My question might be a little controversial, but it's, maybe not, but it's with regards to the objectivist view of suicide. How do objectivists view suicide, given that the core idea of objectivism seems to be my life and my values and my decision to go the way that I see fit, regardless of what the community says? Um, yeah. Can I ask what, what prompts the question? You may not. <laughs> Fair enough. No, uh, it's uh, part curiosity. Of, yeah, no, no, I, I, maybe I, I, if it's not, it's not, but for me, it's, it's, it's always interesting to like, why is that a question? 
It says, because you're talking about an extreme, at least from my perspective, where your life is either you're in pain or, you know, you're, you're, you have a disease, a, a terminal disease or something like that. But I can, I'm trying to think what will prompt a question where you say, my, if it's my life and my rational decision and, and we're understanding that the, the, the ultimate purpose of life is happiness, living, right? Um, what will constitute a situation where you say all of that is not worth it because there's a pain or some kind of uh, reason for me to give all, up all of this. So I'm just curious, but I'll leave it maybe to uh, the philosopher here to, to, to dive into the depth well, of this. So, so you're yeah. looking out of this? That's Suicide fine. can make sense <laughs> in certain cases where the very thing, I mean, and you don't have, I won't take the time to list all the different kinds of cases, but there can be like extreme pain and suffering with next to no uh, prognosis for improvement or anything like that. Living under certain conditions, political conditions, or without certain value, like we're s there's no duty to live, right? I mean, the objectivist emphasis on life is not thou shalt, you know, thou has a duty to live, to persist, whatever, right? It's, I want to be happy. When the very conditions of my happiness, when the greatest values to me are gone or no longer available, it can make sense. Now, in very, you know, very special, extraordinary circumstances, but it can make sense. Because again, it's all to be value driven and what's really realistic in terms of your ability to have the very things that make life worth living. Yeah. Can I and it's important, yeah. like, Life means life. I mean, th th you have this great phrase, and I think it's in viable values, but it's not morgue avoidance. Now, you're stressing the temporary morgue avoidance, but m it's not, wow, they, you've had a beating heart as long as possible. It's that you envision a kind of life that you want to lead. That, that would be worth doing for its own sake. And, and what suicide comes up as a legitimate possibility and a tragic possibility is I can't have that kind of life. I can't have anything close. I can't have a kind of life that would be worth living. And that's the thing, is that the perspective is life is not non-death. It's a, it's a positive conception of something that is rewarding and worth living through. Okay, can I end on a, on a psychological note? So the most relevant insight in objectivism from my perspective as a psychologist, as a clinical psychologist who's, you know, assessed and treated suicidality and every variant of, you know, suicidal ideation, behavior, et cetera, for, what, two decades now. The most relevant insight by far is that life is the standard that makes all other values possible. So the choice is something or nothing ever again. Right? The choice is existence, this one ticket we get to existence, and then we try to make of it what we can and get, you know, rest what joy we can and what meaning we can from that, that transient opportunity or nothing. And in just about every case, you know, and I absolutely am an advocate for you know, euthanasia in cases, in end of life, you know, I absolutely don't think there should be like a law against killing ourselves because there's no duty and you know, we own our lives. As to the actual kind of rational justification for suicide it, that would really overpower the opportunities available, the hopes that are kind of still on the horizon for someone so long as they live, I have yet to, and I'm open to it, but I've yet to encounter a case of someone who's not terminally ill, of someone who is considering or enacting you know, suicidal intentions for mental health reasons, where there's not some distortion of reality that can be repaired if they live long enough to get the help and support. So I just wanna throw that out there as context. Uh, that's really everybody. helpful, thank you. Thank you. So we have an online question. Um, do you have an explanation for why people in the objectivist movement went from dogmatism to skepticism? Or was it just a natural swing of the pendulum? Uh, from dogmatism to more subjectivism. And I wouldn't put it exactly as a swing. I'd just say that there were more of those people and I think they felt the movement was safer to come into because the dogmatists weren't out there hunting them down. But uh, Interesting. <laughs> I, I think this falls in the category that 
you know, the default is, is point that Gina is making. The default is not to get things right. It's really hard for oneself to be objective. And now add the difficulty of how do we create a movement that's objective? And there's no central planner for the movement who can enforce it, right? We all have to have certain judgments of who we interact with and in what terms. So I think it's just, it's a really hard achievement. And one of the things that I'm really proud of, and I give ARI a lot of credit here, um, even though we don't control the movement, we're not running a movement, but I think we've been a really good influence is trying to encourage the more positive, rational attitude towards values. But I think the overall movement is healthier. I think those of us who've been coming to Ocon for decades, it's, I, I think, better than ever, a, be a more healthy environment than I've ever seen it. And that's really exciting. And I think we'll continue to grow in that way. Yeah. To be clear, though, I still see plenty of dogmatism. So no one's immune from dogmatism <laughs> just because, you know, culturally we've taken a bit of a yeah. different swing. So just for the rest. I think that I would just add one thing in terms of this. And again, swing to subjectivism isn't maybe the best term or way of describing the phenomenon. But I think you can the great release from a dogmatic, intrinsicist way of taking the objectivist ethics in particular is, you know, more personalized. But the personalized doesn't mean subjective, and to guard against that does require the vigilant, active rationality that I was referring to earlier. So, like, am I, like, letting myself get away with something here or not? You got to be goddamn honest with yourself. And sometimes it's like, no, I have to try harder on this or I have to do something else on this. So I think in part, it's really understanding the objectivist ethics and how following it is in your best interest. Not cheating it sometimes, because I think if there's that subconscious premise of, ooh, this is easy, this is like, I can just do what I want now. No, no, that's not the idea. I can just do what I want on an as-wanted basis. So there's a lot of thinking and self-honesty that has to go into avoiding the subjectivist side of things. Mm -hmm. So uh, on cashing in, I wanted to ask about the actual action of doing what you want and, and whether you might succeed, you might fail, you might learn, you might be, it might be difficult for you to actually produce action or you might. How do you integrate action with the introspective and how does that whole iterative thing work? You know, mm -hmm. What's the recommendation for that? Maybe I, I'll start. I, I, um, this is something I mentioned about that I found, I found hard. Um, there was a question in, in, originally, what, what is the most underappreciated thing in, in, uh, in objectivism? And for me, it was the, the, the importance of introspection. Um, I find that what's really, and Ayn Rand has this quote about if you were 5% as introspective as retrospective, we would be a race of giants, and I think she's so right about it. And what I think a lot of people don't get is that Ayn Rand is an introspective genius. And her ability to see what's going on inside, understand, appreciate, differentiate, is at the levels that I, I don't know, you can even imagine. But the little that I do, every time that I turn inside to take Everything that I'm doing and, and, and stopping and, and just turning the focus inside is like, what is the meaning of what I'm doing to me? Um, the cashing in is, in, for me, starts in that process of like, you know, tapping myself on the back it happens in that domain of, this is really good. I mean, look at how much progress we've made. Look at how much um, I'm clearer on those, those things. Look at how much... Um, the goals that I have for myself are so much bigger and audacious than the year before and so on. So the, for me, that it's, it's, part, it's, part, it's not just the doing, it's the doing and then the introspection on the doing that have formed a new habit of cashing in. So what my recommendation is just integrate into your life this um, practice of turning inward, which is very hard because you have to be, for me, in a quiet place, for a long time, still with energy to focus. Sometimes write it down, sometimes just think about it, sometimes doing it in the shower. But without that, I find that I'm just uh, not, you know, not deriving as much as I can out of my, my doing. Can I follow up? So I think, Tal, what you describe is a common failure mode. I mean, what you've overcome 
you know, through your story, it's a common failure mode for a certain kind of person who's more technical, who's more action oriented by default, you know, who's maybe in the STEM kind of um, fields, who, you know, kind of more on the engineering rather than, you know, the physics side of, um, of life and inquiry. And I have seen at least as many, if not, I'm lying. I have seen far more cases of the opposite failure mode, <laughs> where the opposite failure mode is that you get so kind of stuck in introspection, you get so kind of stuck in your head, in you know, what is colloquially called analysis paralysis, in what I call kind of pretend problem solving, or in effect, you know, emoting with words, but it feels like you're gaining clarity and you're learning something new about yourself in absence of new incoming data from the world. That's really the failure mode. Again, but the point is both of these are failure modes. They're defaults. The, the hard thing, the thing that you, you have to build through iteration and experience is the real work of living, which is reflective in its nature and which is out in the world. And I, one of the most inspiring resources for me on this issue has actually been Paul Graham, who I want to put in a plug for his essay, I think Tara recommended. This specific essay, right? Yes, how, and how, I, how I was like, great. wow, this is the best thing anybody's recommended that I read in a long time. Okay, so, that's so what I'm high endorsement. There you go. Yeah, How to Do Great Work is a particular one that's more recent that really it sketches a, a, an approach to building a career if you're someone ambitious. But as part of that approach, he really articulates a lot of the uh, the mechanics of iterating in the way you're talking about between you know, like specific tactical level, like, you know, go and work on a project, like work on a project at some sort of an institution, organization, company, whatever that you admire, where like your curiosity and really let your curiosity drive the, especially kind of that early choice of what you work on. Don't worry too much about, you know, how exactly is it going to add up to like a 50 year career, but just like go do something that's a project at a place where, where there are really smart people to the earlier question about relationships and how they can foster ambition, you know, and like own the project and work at it, it kind of give it your all and then like, tr then like do the following things to sort of build on that success, you know, and like go seek out the next project and here's what to do with failures and sort of here. So it gets quite tactical, but I think his orientation is very right when it comes to the work of building a great life and career, at least certainly the career part. So, yeah. So we have great. about two minutes left. Do you guys have do you have any closing thoughts that you want to give, or should we take one more question? You should, happy to take one more question. Yeah. Do we go to 3:20? Am I completely bad at time management? Oh my god. How much god. time do we have? All right, we have 12 minutes left. So Keep much coming. Time. Infinite time. <laughs> okay. Has uh, my daughter collapsed on the floor? I'm sorry, I just can't help hold my questions. Up. Okay, we're good. Okay, <laughs> please proceed. <laughs> okay, uh, my question was almost answered with the previous one, but um, I have a variation. During can you this get closer to the microphone? Yeah. Sorry. Get closer to the mic. During this introspection process, how can you really identify who are you and what do you want from what others made you believe? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. Yeah. How do you distinguish who yeah. you are and what you want? from what others make you believe about yourself? Yeah, during this uh, introspection process. Hmm. I, I, I have, um, because of, of me having so many second-handed uh, values, uh, I call them spider values because they kind of seep into your value system without you knowing that they're not yours and you're following them thinking that they're going to give you happiness and you pursue them and they, they give you nothing back. Um, the way to know that a value is authentically yours, it, it integrates in every dimension reflecting about who you are. It, they, they, uh, when you ask yourself, is it my, are there other values that are from the same type? They're, they're showing me that if I love this, it makes sense for me for the, to love that because they're all a reflection of one entity, one integrated entity, that, which is you. And uh, in the workshop that I do, I, it's sometimes like somebody says something, this is what I want. But it doesn't integrate with what I call the value theme that emerges from all of the values that they've professed. That they, they, and there's the one thing that just doesn't add up. It's like doesn't fit the puzzle of who you are. Um, 
So when you, when you encounter something that you tell yourself, yeah, that's something I value, that's something meaningful to me, but it doesn't integrate or you cannot really explain to yourself what it is that, why it is that I'm not spending time doing it or like I feel conflicted when I pursue this, I would go deeper into like, how did I end up even wanting this? Did I really choose this? Uh, is it, a lot of things that I ask myself, did I always want something like this or did it emerge from a new relationship. Suddenly, I met someone and she's very social and suddenly, yeah, I like parties. I never loved parties, never went out to party, but now I do. And it, it's, it's, maybe it's because of her and it's not because of me and, uh, and there's an issue uh, and so on and so forth. So just the, the uh, integrated nature of a value that is complete, feels completely mine, reflects on who I am, is where I trust a value to be completely mine. Otherwise, I'm, I have suspicious uh, I have to admit, kind of I've... attitude towards things that I say I want, but I don't really. I'll give you a concrete example. I really want to publish a book. I really want to publish a book. I want to say something about what I have to say. I find it really hard to sit down on my butt and write. <laughs> right? Why? Right standing up. What? Right, standing up. Yeah, oh, <laughs> that's a good idea. I didn't try it. Leave it to the psychologist. Yeah. But anyway, I, I had to dive into, like, do I really want to write a book? And I had to convince myself that I really want to write a book because it's, it sounds good to have a book, right? But it's a pain. So I had, to, I had to, uh, to be suspicious for a while. Is it really something I want to do because I don't enjoy it and so on and so forth? So uh, having that um, kind of deliberation with yourself, is it really something I want can I prove to myself that I want it? Is, is the kind of discussion I have with myself yeah, there, about those things. Yeah, I just want to say there's a broader toolkit too of the kinds of tools, exercises Tal is talking about. There's a values clarification kind of canon literature. You can see a subset of exercises I've pulled together. If you go to In Defense of Radical Self-Betterment, which is an article I wrote for a publication called Every, and then click on light, the Life Vision exercise, which is a link in that uh, essay it'll take you to a publicly available Google Doc that you can copy and go through. And it has a bunch of exercises, some of which uh, are similar to what Tal's talking about. But for different people, different prompts turn out to be helpful or uh, um, turn out to kind of yield fresh insight. And for you, and I disclaim at the start of that worksheet, all these exercises are optional, pick the ones that resonate for you. But resonate doesn't necessarily mean come easily because the ones that will unlock the most important kind of insights for you may be the ones that hurt, the ones that are scary and hard and kind of radioactive when you first look at them. Like, ooh, I don't want to think about when I felt most alive because then I end up kind of with a situation where those aren't the things I'm doing anymore because I've now gone down this other rabbit hole for reasons that aren't that clear to me. So. Thank you. I, can I just add, I'm a little hesitant about what to say here, but I'll say this. Um, trust yourself. Trust, like, how can I tell, like, is this what other people think? Like, my first reaction was, how could you not? Like, <laughs> give voice to you. Mm -hmm. Give voice to yourself and what you want. So maybe one thing to do is, of all these, I, yeah, I want that. Really? Just keep asking yourself, like, really? Why? How could I explain it? What is it about that that I want, that I like? Like, mm -hmm. make yourself explain to yourself <laughs> why I, because that might expose some of the, oh, I see my parents want that, but maybe I don't really want. So, yeah. would I still want to do yourself, it if I do it anonymously? But to keep asking the really question, really me? Is this what I want? Sorry. Would I still want to do it if I had to do it anonymously? Uh, oh. That's often a question that will quickly get kind of cut to that. But, but yeah, I think trusting what people call your gut, but which is actually kind of that honest I mean, inner voice. Honest. But part of what I think Tara was bringing out that I agree with is it, it's a muscle that you build. Yeah. Part of what yes, happens it is, is. It, like, as you become a stronger valuer, it's self-evident. Like, this is mine, and mm -hmm. oh, that's, that, that's not really mine. But that voice... Yeah. You have to build it's, it up yes. through you have to practice over true. time by it. asking those probing questions. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Give it voice. Thank you for asking that, though. It's a, it's a good question. Hi. So uh, many people here at Ocon 
have cashed in on objectivism and changed their lives as a result. I, I, I know for myself that uh, if it wasn't for Ayn Rand, I'd probably be living in a van down by a river. So, um, could, could you share some personal stories from where your life would have been very different if it wasn't for objectivism? Ooh. So many. Yeah, <laughs> where I do mean, we God. <laughs> Figuratively, I'd be in the gutter. I mean, seriously. Um, yeah. Oh, I don't know where to begin, but I mean, yeah. same. Yeah. Go, go on. Sorry. <laughs> it's painful to think about, actually. Yeah. It's just, I would have become an accountant so that. I mean, speaking of the question, you know, how do you know what you want versus what, like, I don't think I would have ever even let myself ask the question because I would have felt like a bad daughter and I, you know, I would have continued in kind of entrenching my own cynicism about people and about myself and there would be the, the kind of vicious cycle of hating myself and hating others would just continue to spiral and then I would probably end up a lonely misanthrope in a really pathetic, unfulfilling career. And with a lot of I'd, mental health issues. I'd have met you there. <laughs> I, no, I'd, I'd have drifted further into Christianity and Catholicism. That was, you know, yeah. I definitely would have drifted more and more into that. I, I feel very passionately about this uh, because <clears throat> I, I, I wouldn't go into Christianity or, or something like that, but I, and I wouldn't be an accountant. But <laughs> <laughs> I don't know never, if I would never have here, Here's the, I wasn't here's the horrible never an alternative. <laughs> here's the real uh, uh, horrible alternative, and I won't. I would live an average life. I would have continued to live an average life. And you would meet me on the street and say, yeah, that guy's normal. He has a great job, has money in the bank, you know, you know, wife, three kids, paid the mortgage, has a sports car, some hobbies on the weekend. Good. For me, that's super bad. This is, for me, the, yeah. the, the life that it's is the done. worst, Quite which done. is a dead man walking in the sense of I, I would never have discovered how passionate I can become about everything, about everything. Uh, Rand woke me up and what you see out there, and I'm, again, sorry, I'm getting passionate here. Most of the people you see outside in the street, unfortunately, are zombies. Zombies, they look fine, they have a job, and they're like, but they're zombies. And uh, unfortunately, again, some people around that I know in my community, I go and I meet them and I ask them what happened, what are you doing, and so on and so forth. And I, I, I become so sad to hear the fact that their life is just empty, void, of, because they've killed the muscle of valuing. Their love life is horrible. They, they forgot what good sex looks like. They actually, in, in a way, turn it into like a, maybe having an affair on the side is the way to satisfy this and I hate my job but it pays them so they use them their money to I, I, to I think I told this story I went to this successful you know network of people and they the thing they were celebrating is uh, you know how they uh, they learn how to manage their addictions and manage their depressions and so on and so forth I think what you're asking is that without objectivism by default we will be living not just a little less of Good life. And it's true, there are some people who know how to live really well. Like, think about a Steve Jobs. Okay? In a way, he figured it out. He figured it out. You know, the way he talks about values and passion and uncompromising. It's like, look, it's a Howard Rourke. It's just he has figured it out without maybe calling himself an objectivist. By, but the default is this how's life? Can't complain. You know, I'm just I'm waiting to die. Well, and, and yeah. now that we're in the last few seconds, I think just to tie all this together, the, the question that we should really be haunted by is not what would have happened to me if I didn't discover objectivism, because that's sort of off the table. <laughs> the thing that should haunt us and the tragedy and the thing that we're in this room for is, man, what if I found objectivism and didn't get the value from it? And that's, that's the thing that I try to get continually better at. And uh, I hope we helped you guys do the same. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.